Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. It's time for a news announcement video, not in the usual slot on a Friday, and not even in our usual release time, because for some reason, both Intel and Nvidia jointly decided that announcing their latest parts at midnight in the USA is the best choice for everyone. Can't say I fully understand that logic, but here we are earlier than usual about to discuss a whole range of new CPUs and GPUs. If you've been following the rumors, you know this one has been coming for a long time. What we're going to go through is the announcements of both Intel's 10th generation Comet Lake H series processors, as well as Nvidia's GeForce RTX Super GPUs for mobile form factors. We'll go through specs, new features, and take a brief look at some laptops set to use these parts. However, we can't share performance benchmarks just yet. We'll be back in a few weeks to go over all of that stuff. I think this is gonna be a particularly interesting launch on the CPU side because AMD have already snuck in first with both the announcement of their Ryzen Mobile 4000 series and performance reviews for H series. So today we're kind of getting to see how Intel will be responding in this generation. Should be a bit of discussion around that as we go. We'll start with the CPU stuff. Intel's 10th generation Comet Lake H series, which is for high performance productivity and gaming notebooks. We've already seen Comet Lake U series come to the market last year, targeting the ultra portable space. So this is just rounding out Intel's lineup with 45 watt parts. As this is Comet Lake, we are still getting 14 nanometer parts with essentially the same architecture as Skylake, but with a few minor tweaks as expected. So given Intel is kind of stuck on 14 nanometer, what are they offering this generation to keep up? Well, the big one is the introduction of a new eight core processor into the Core i7 range called the Core i7-10875H. Not a great name, but I think that's something we're used to with Intel processors these days. The Core i7-10875H essentially delivers what Intel was offering previously with the Core i9-9880H, but brings it down from the expensive Core i9 tier to the more mainstream Core i7 seven tier. We don't have any unit pricing right now on these parts, but just as an example, the customer price for a 9880H was $556 US compared to $395 for the 6-core 9850H and 9750H. With 8 cores now in the Core i7 lineup, it should be cheaper for OEMs to offer an 8-core part, so laptops that previously used the Core i7-9750H should be getting a Core i7-10875H this generation for around the same retail price with all else equal. Outside of the 10875H, a lot of the other CPUs are minor revisions to what we had previously. The Core i5 lineup remains at 4 cores and 8 threads. There are also still two other Core i7 processors offering 6 cores and 12 threads. While at the top of the stack is the Core i9-10980HK continuing to offer the best 8 core performance in this lineup with the highest clock speeds in an unlocked package. Intel did spend a lot of time talking about single thread performance and how they're pushing clock speeds up with this 10th generation. And you'll see across this lineup that we have at least five gigahertz single core turbos for the Core i7 lineup and up. However, there are lots of caveats here that make these clock speed figures less impressive than they might appear. Take the Core i7-10750H, the six core successor to the popular Core i7-9750H. There's actually been no change to the base clock here. It still sits at 2.6 gigahertz, which suggests there hasn't been much of an efficiency improvement. The boost clock has jumped up to five gigahertz on paper from 4.5 gigahertz, but some of that is down to Intel's thermal velocity boost, which is now available in Core i7 processors. This means that the five gigahertz boost clock figure will only be achieved when the CPU is running under a certain thermal threshold, which Intel told us was 65 degrees Celsius. Between 65C and 85C, the maximum available turbo clock will drop one notch, and then above 85C, it will drop another notch. The end result is under stress, and let's not forget that lots of H-series laptops run quite hot. Boost clocks will actually top out at 4.8 gigahertz, possibly 4.9 gigahertz if you get a good cooler. This is a single digit percentage improvement over the 9750H's maximum clock. Similar story right at the top of the stack with the Core i9-10980HK. A 2.4 gigahertz base clock on eight cores is identical to what Intel were offering with the i9-9980HK. However, now we get a 5.3 gigahertz thermal velocity boost 
boost up from 5 gigahertz. Intel says above 85C that drops to 5.1 gigahertz, which is 300 megahertz higher than the non-thermal velocity boost numbers on the 9980HK. Intel also told us the chip has a 4.4 gigahertz all-core turbo, which is up from 4.2 gigahertz with the previous gen. Then for the 10875H, we're basically just getting a Core i9-9880H as we talked about earlier, with a slightly higher turbo frequency provided by thermal velocity boost, around 300 megahertz higher in the best case. And this remains the same for the rest of the parts. If we're lucky, we're seeing a 100 megahertz higher base clock and up to 400 megahertz higher turbo clock, which at the absolute best case is a 10% improvement. The rest of these processor specs remain pretty similar to previous generations too. Cache sizes are kept the same at 8 megabytes for quad cores, 12 megabytes for 6 cores, and 16 megabytes for 8 cores. Memory support has received a small bump though. Previous generations supported up to DDR4-2666. Now we're getting DDR4-2933 support. The other new feature Intel lists are partially integrated Wi-Fi 6 support and a one-click overclock method for unlocked CPUs. So the summary here is really we're just getting a minor clock speed bump to existing parts, as well as the introduction of a new 8-core part into the Core i7 series, which itself is just bringing down a Core i9 part to a cheaper price point. That's pretty much it. Intel wasn't willing to give any interesting performance numbers. They focused mostly on comparing 10th gen to three-year-old 7th gen configurations. This does have its place given a lot of people will be making that sort of upgrade, but omitting performance compared to the previous generation is disappointing. Oh, and for that 7th to 10th gen gaming comparison, the GPUs used for each system are substantially different at a GTX 1080 versus RTX 2080, so yeah, it's not a very useful chart at all. Given we're just getting a small clock speed bump, it's not a particularly strong response to AMD's Ryzen Mobile 4000 series, which we know is significantly faster than Intel's existing 8-core mobile processors in most workloads, and it's also massively more efficient. But there's not a lot Intel can do. They pulled the best move they could in bringing 8 cores down to Core i7 to match the 8 cores AMD offers in that segment, and they are testing the waters with a huge 5.3 gigahertz on their top end part. We'll have to wait and see how these chips perform in benchmarks, but on paper, it doesn't look like it'll be enough to compete. Now let's talk about NVIDIA's GeForce RTX Super lineup. Luckily, this is far more interesting of a launch than I first thought it would be. It looked like we'd just be getting super GPUs and all the usual things that that sort of GPU upgrade would bring, but actually NVIDIA have some cool technologies for this generation. But before those technologies, let's look at the lineup and specifications. Get that out of the way. There are three new parts being introduced today. The RTX 2080 Super, the RTX 2070 Super, and the GTX 1650 Ti. Clock speeds and power targets do vary between each of the models. The lower end of the spectrum will typically be the Max-Q variant, and the upper range is the Full Performance or Max-P model. The two Super models offer the same core configuration as the desktop part, so 3072 CUDA cores for the RTX 2080 Super up from 2944 in the non-Super model, and 2560 for the RTX 2070 Super up from 2304. However, while the desktop variants also pushed up clock speeds in addition to adding more cores, we're seeing the opposite with the Super lineup on laptops. Cores have increased, but clocks have decreased slightly to fit within the same power envelope. Take the RTX 2070 Super for example, we have 256 more CUDA cores, but these will be clocked at a maximum boost of 1380 MHz in the 115 watt variant, down from 1455 MHz with the non-Super SKU also at 115 watts. The memory system remains the same though, 8 GB of GDDR6, providing 448 GB per second of bandwidth. The RTX 2080 Super doesn't get faster memory like the desktop card either. The GTX 1650 Ti is also new, but it's not clear why this part exists. It offers the same 1024 CUDA cores as the GTX 1650 at the same power target with similar clocks and the same memory system. Perhaps this is an attempt to distinguish the top end GTX 1650 configuration from some of the lower end configurations that use GDDR5 for example. It's also interesting to note that the RTX 2070 and RTX 2060 will be remaining in the market for now, but with slightly altered specifications. In what is no doubt going to be confusing for customers, previously the RTX 2070 was listed with an 1185 to 1440 MHz clock, now that's inexplicably 1125 to 1455 MHz. Same with the RTX 2060, this GPU is now available in a 115 watt configuration rather than the 90 watts that it topped out previously. 
Where is the RTX 2060 Super, you might ask? Well, ASUS seems to think this GPU exists. They provided us with a slide that includes the RTX 2060 Super for laptops, complete with the same CUDA core count as the desktop part, but with lower clocks. However, NVIDIA tells us there is no RTX 2060 Super as part of this launch, and that their slide is the correct one, the one that doesn't have this part in it. This doesn't fully rule out an RTX 2060 Super from existing, but it's not part of today's announcements. Unfortunately, NVIDIA really hasn't done anything to address the confusion surrounding the naming of these parts and the different performance configurations that will be available. Each GPU will still have multiple TDP options, such as 80 watts and 90 watts for the RTX 2060, with no differentiation in naming. Then there will be Max-Q options as well, and the end result is there could be many different GPU options, all with RTX 2070 branding, when you factor across the Super and non-Super models, the Max-Q and non-Max-Q models, and then all the different power configurations of those variants. This is extremely confusing for customers in my opinion, calling a GPU the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 2070 Super Max-Q, I nearly stuffed that up, the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 2070 Super Max-Q, that's quite a ridiculous name if I'm honest, and that doesn't even tell us which power configuration we're getting. Not going to rant much more about that, although it does annoy me greatly. Let's talk about the new features, changes, and technologies. The main one isn't really a technology, but it's definitely a good change. NVIDIA has lowered the pricing across their lineup to fit in these new Super GPUs. Laptops that previously included the GTX 1660 Ti should now be able to offer the RTX 2060 at the same price. Same with the RTX 2060, that should become an RTX 2070 category, with the new Super products taking on the top end of the market. This leaves the 1660 Ti and 1650 Ti replacing what used to be 1650 class laptops. The end result is NVIDIA expects the RTX 2060 to be available in $1,000 laptops and the GTX 1650 at $700. As for technologies, well, NVIDIA spent some time talking about the enhancements they've made to Max-Q, which is their high-efficiency GPU program. With this new generation, we can expect more efficient components as a start, including new lower-voltage GDDR6 modules and improvements to voltage regulators. This means more power and thermal budget available for the GPU, so these Max-Q laptops should perform better overall. Another really cool feature is NVIDIA's version of AMD SmartShift, which they're calling Dynamic Boost. Like SmartShift, this is a way to balance the power and performance between the CPU and GPU in a system like a laptop that has a shared thermal solution. When you're in a game and the CPU isn't being utilized as heavily as the GPU, Dynamic Boost can reduce the power of the CPU and increase the power of the GPU to improve performance while keeping within the thermal constraints of the system. NVIDIA says this can provide up to a 10% improvement. AMD has integrated this feature into their APU platform and it works across Ryzen and Radeon GPUs. NVIDIA of course can't just go and integrate Dynamic Boost into the CPU, which raises the question of how they are achieving this. And the answer is with a hardware solution that gathers power information on the CPU and feeds that back into a software solution that then adjusts power between the CPU and GPU as necessary. NVIDIA told us that this solution works with both Intel and AMD CPUs, so you can expect the technology to be used with any NVIDIA Max-Q laptop, provided the OEM is interested. And that last part is key. The feature is not a requirement of Max-Q laptops, but rather an optional one. That said, NVIDIA believe most OEMs will use the feature. It will also be controllable through the NVIDIA control panel if you wish to disable it. Unfortunately for now, it only works with games. There will be no dynamic boost controls available with creator or compute applications. It's also not something NVIDIA can deliver via a software update. It does utilize new hardware found only in this new generation. The other great new addition, and this has been a long time coming, is finally the ability to have both Optimus and G-Sync capabilities in the same system with a dynamic switch between the two. A very small number of laptops have included this feature through a hardware switch, but with this new generation of super laptops, NVIDIA will now be providing this display switch automatically through advanced Optimus, with no reboots required. The reason why this is needed is that for G-Sync support, the GPU needs to be connected directly to the display. But for Optimus, to switch back to the iGPU for power saving measures, 
The display would also have to be connected to the iGPU, so you get a bit of a conflict there. This conflict meant that most G-Sync laptops ditched Optimus entirely. Now, with Nvidia's dynamic display switch hardware, laptops will get the best of both worlds. And that's all the announcements for now from both Nvidia and Intel. Lots of new components to dive into in the coming weeks. Based on the information OEMs are providing, it sounds like most gaming laptops this generation will be sticking to an Intel 10th Gen CPU plus Nvidia Super combination, at least in the major lineups. Laptops like the ASUS ROG Strix series, MSI Thin, Gigabyte Aero, HP Omen, Razer Blade, and more have all decided to use this combination for their latest generation. I don't have any problem with the GPU choice there, as NVIDIA are still clearly the leaders in mobile GPUs. They have the efficiency crown, and that's what you need to win in laptops. I'm actually quite looking forward to seeing some of the interesting new technologies that NVIDIA are putting in these laptops. My main concern is more around 10th gen CPUs. It's disappointing to see so few gaming machines opt for Ryzen Mobile, or at least offer it as an option, given it looks like a more compelling product than Intel 10th Gen in terms of performance and efficiency. Take ASUS's new lineup, for example. Of their 12 listed variants, only three of them use Ryzen CPUs, with the fastest GPU on offer being an RTX 2060. Everything above that in the performance tier on the GPU side is pairing Intel with Nvidia. And some other brands don't appear to be using Ryzen at all. Of course, we haven't tested the performance of Intel 10th gen yet, so we can't say for sure which is the best option. But I think some people will be searching through Nvidia Super laptop announcements today, trying to find the Ryzen 4000 plus RTX 2070 Super laptops, for example, and just not seeing them. Part of this will be down to development costs. ASUS mentioned that switching over some of their high-end designs to Ryzen 4000, take the top-end Zephyrus models, for example, would be a lot of work, and they're not willing to do that right now. The other part is brand, and Intel still dominates there among system buyers. But if people do buy the Ryzen options in droves, slowly the tides will turn there, and I think we'll see more Ryzen options come to the market, perhaps with NVIDIA Super GPUs. And that's it for all the announcements out of Intel and NVIDIA today. Nice that they had an NDA expiring at the same time. Makes my life easy. Just one video so that you guys can get all the information. Of course, I'd recommend that you subscribe to our channel at Hardware Unbox so you don't miss our reviews of both 10th Gen Intel CPUs and NVIDIA Super GPUs when we get that hardware in. There is an NDA date set for a couple of weeks from now, so we will be able to share all the information on that then and how these chips perform and compare to stuff like Ryzen and other GPUs, so definitely stay tuned for that one. You can also support us through our Patreon page. Links to that are in the description below, as you will also find links to our merch store where you can buy t-shirts, mugs, hoodies, all that sort of thing. So yeah, that's it for this one. I'll catch you in the next one.